A great lesson idea for population studies. Class on the move. We all have to teach migration studies as part of geography. Now this idea is called class on the move and what it does is it takes certain scenarios and it gets the children to think about the impact that these scenarios will have on migration. Now people move, obviously if you move you migrate. They do for positive reasons which is what we call pull factors and negative reasons which is what we call push factors. Initially what we do is we have a quick introduction to what push and pull factors are and what migration is. And then I'll give the students the opportunity to move around. So what I'd like you to do, so if you all stand in the middle to start off with, the way I set this up is initially I move all the desks to the side of the room, I've got a big space in the middle, and then using a PowerPoint presentation with about six or seven slides, I have lots of different scenarios on it. What you have to do is you have to look at these different scenarios and decide whereabouts in the class you would initially move to. On you go. Rian, you've decided that you're going to move to this area where industry has started. Why have you decided to move to there? Because um, there will be lots of jobs open already and it means that I don't have to wait until something starts up before I can go and apply for a job. Okay, very good. Because there are jobs there, what kind of fact, that'd be an example, what kind of factor? A uh, pull factor. Very good. Right, let's have uh, a look at the next scenario. There you go. Over a period of time, what happens is the slides change, the scenarios differ, and the students look at the information, they take this on board, and then based on what they see, they will decide whether they stay where they are or whether they move to a particular area. You're in the middle of a river. Why are you in the middle of a river? Because you can start up a fishing industry, and since no one else is here, it'll be really easy. So you could monopolise the fishing industry. Well, that's actually a really good reason for moving there. Now, the way to avoid everyone sort of moving to one particular place is to ensure that you start to ask them some quite structured questions about why they decided to move to one particular area. And I think if you start to do that, they'll start to think about the reasons as to why they've gone there, and then on the back of that, they'll start to make their own informed decisions as to whereabouts in the classroom they want to move to. It's quite interesting because no one has decided to go over here, and this is where the industry started to go into decline. Now, can someone give me some reasons why would this be an example of a push factor? Because you lost your job and you have no income. Good. You might have mortgage problems. So you've just done a classic example then of, of a push factor because jobs are starting to run out and you've moved now to where the town is growing bigger where there are jobs are being created for, which is an example of a pull factor. Let's see how the scenario now changes. Now I think this lesson works really well because Migration is all about making decisions. It's all about movement. It's actually physically getting them to migrate around the classroom. And by doing this, they get a real good idea of what migration means and the concepts and the factors that make people migrate. A great lesson idea for people, work and employment. Public meeting role play. When I'm teaching the unit on people, work and employment, um, one of the questions on the GCSE exam paper frequently asks the students to give their ideas for viewpoints for different groups of people. And I find that they often struggle to identify the most appropriate groups of people and they sometimes struggle to maximise their marks in that particular question. So my idea to try and get them to develop this skill is to teach part of this unit through a role play exercise. Now this property group has just secured planning permission for a £120 million redevelopment of a disused airfield and their plan is that the development will be a business park. One of the role plays that I do is centred around this idea of locating a development. Now, different groups of people have got different viewpoints about this development centre. And we, we will divide the students into groups there. to represent these people's viewpoints. So, for example, we might use groups like environmentalists, um, various local residence groups. In the envelope on the table, there are some cards. I want you to take the cards out of the envelope and I want you to select the cards where the information might give you some reasons why your particular group would either be opposed to or would be in favour of this development. Increased profitability, definitely want that. 
To help the students identify the reasons why their group of people would have that, their particular viewpoint, we do a card sort exercise. So they have to sort through the information that they've got. They've got to accept um, some of the statements on the cards and use those to help them formulate their opinion and reject the others. The next stage is to get them to actually prioritise their reasons because some reasons will have more um, impact or will be able to, to score more marks than others. For each group, you've got a planning grid, OK? And if you look carefully, that planning grid has got, in the column on the left-hand side, some words that help you to connect or to move your argument on. Firstly, also, as well as this, furthermore. Then we've got some connectives in the centre. So what you're going to do is you're going to give the reason why you either agree or disagree with the argument. But the key thing is you have to explain that argument. There's n you won't get any marks for just identifying the reason. You've got to explain. We think this because. <laughs> we'll start with that, actually. The, the traffic congested. Yeah. I don't know if you go to the museum too. OK, guys. In the bags on the floor beside you, there is some gear that you can dress up in to assume the character of that, that group of people. The next stage is to get each group to identify a spokesperson and they feed back the viewpoint of their particular group of people to a public audience, which effectively becomes the rest of the class. It will create 2,000 new job opportunities, which will reduce the impact of a recession. Our quality of life will be significantly reduced because it's operating 24 hours a day, 364 days a year. We'll be back in work. There'll be loads of excess work for us. We can do some overtime and, you know, it will result in us earning new money. Skylarks and brown hair breed on the um, disused airfield. This, this means that the new development will destroy the habitat. When it comes to the most important element, which is to try and improve their exam performance, they have something that will trigger memories in their mind when they're under pressure. They remember their friends dressing up as the property developer or dressing up as the environmentalist. They remember them delivering those viewpoints and hopefully they remember to extend their own arguments if they want to maximise their marks in the paper. A great lesson idea for population studies. The jelly baby game. So what you've got in front of you are jelly babies. The idea of the jelly baby game is to teach the students about how population structures in particular places or countries change depending on different scenarios. And these different scenarios will focus on birth rates, death rates and the impact of migration. All the jelly babies are obviously different colours. Red represents people who are aged over 65. Each jelly baby, depending on what colour it is, represents a different cohort within that population structure. They're all given an equal number of jelly babies and they have to record on a separate bit of paper how many jelly babies they have and what the jelly babies represent in terms of their population structure. There are some scenario cards here. What you need to do is take the scenario cards out of the pack. The game begins when one particular student takes one of the scenario cards and based on the information they see on that particular scenario card, will determine whether they take some jelly babies from a pot of jelly babies in the middle or whether they have to give a jelly baby back. Ooh, your country experiences an influx of migrant workers, gain five adult males. All even-numbered countries have a sudden population boom, gain two children. A flood affects country five, two people are killed. And so what happens as the game starts to move on, the population structure of that particular country will change, as it does in real life. What have you got left? So you've yes. got one, I have one male, male child. child. So what's, what sort of things um, happen that mean you've only got one male child left? I lost half my female adults due to AIDS and prostitution. Yeah. Right. right. Prize at the end of the game, because you haven't eaten any of the jelly babies at all during the lesson, is that you can eat them as your prize. OK. <laughs> A great lesson idea for ecosystems. Model making plants and animals. I'm really excited by ecosystems, but you know what it's like sometimes when you're teaching year 10 and 11 their GCSE, they're not always on board with you. 
I've found a really exciting way of actually teaching ecosystems, and that is not just using textbooks, but trying to get the students to think creatively, to actually use card sorts, and then to go on and make models from clay. In the envelope, there are a number of statements which relate to the characteristics of either animals or plants. Your first task is to take the statements out of the envelope okay, and sort out those statements into those that you think are relevant for your climate graph. The lesson I frequently teach um, has three different environments in it, all contrasting the hot desert, the tropical rainforest and the cold environment and the students are instructed to either make an animal or a plant. It needs thick fur uh, because it's going to be really cold, cold yep. in winter. Um, and thick skin for the same reason. The cards have all sorts of adjectives on. It could be agile, it could be thick fur. The students are thinking through those cards, sorting those cards, and going back to their climate graph and thinking about which adjectives best fit the plants and animals in that climate. So which ones are you sorting? Which ones have you come up with? Um, for, we're in the hot desert climate. Uh, life cycle within days, okay. stores water, like strong sun, uh, runners put down roots, and deep root system. Once we've done the card sorting, we then get the modelling clay out. Even though they're year 10 and 11, they still really love the modelling clay, and they really like to get their hands dirty. What I don't want you to do is replicate an animal or plant which already exists. So I don't want you to actually produce a cactus. I don't want you to produce a camel. The idea is that the students then take their adjectives that apply to their animal and plant from their climate and they begin to think about those characteristics and make a model of their own. Well, I think there should be fruit at the top on like top of a long tree. Um, uh, and there's uh, big leaves. Big leaves. To them. And so tall, big leaves, buttress roots. Are you going to make the buttress roots? Yeah. It needs good eyesight, so should we should put the guys into it. Yeah. I think we should have big claws so we can get in the snakes. Using a wide root system, because it has to collect the maximum amount of, um, of water. <laughs> the last thing I would like us to do is to feed back with the model that you've created, explaining to us why you have given your model the characteristics that it has. Ours is a plant in the tropical rainforest. Um, it's got buttress roots, so it's stable. In order to understand what the students have taken in, I get them to present back to the rest of the class, and then at a later date we'll do a formal written assessment as well. Our animal's uh, designed to survive in the tundra, and it's got a uh, white fur so that it can be camouflaged. It also has a prehensile tail, because it, which helps it um, to climb up trees easily to balance. From past experience, attainment has risen through this method because the students have been actively engaged and taken more ownership of their learning. It makes it easier to understand how the animals and plants have to adapt. It helped me like um, understand all the vocabulary used in like the sheet. It's like quite hands-on, and it's like you're getting involved in the learning.